Hi, I'm Gene Allen. On June the 6th, 1949, when uh, Channel 4 went on the air for the very first time, I was in summer school at Oklahoma a and in Stillwater and working as a copywriter at KSPI Radio in Stillwater. I uh, didn't know anybody who owned a television set, but it sounded really interesting. It was in all the papers. And um, I discovered that downtown Stillwater at uh, one of the uh, hardware stores, they had a television set in the window. So I walked down to Main Street and stood outside the window after hours, they were closed and looked at this, probably a 12 inch black and white TV set. Couldn't hear the sound, of course. It was inside the store and I was outside, but I thought that was really something. It was radio with pictures and that really sounded like a big deal to me. I, I decided then and there that if possible, I'd like to work in that field somehow. When fall semester came, I was taking the only radio course that was offered at uh, Oklahoma a and at the time, and our teacher took us on a field trip to the studios in Oklahoma City, which were then in the Little Theater. A fraternity brother of mine, Nick Panis, was the art director uh, on the staff at that time. and um, So we got a tour of the whole place, and uh, once again, it really uh, was something that looked like it'd be very exciting and a great place to work. So when I got back to Stillwater, I sat down and uh, wrote an application letter, sent it off, and uh, absolutely nothing happened. So I finished school, graduating there in um, 1950, and stayed on at KSPI uh, writing radio copy. I'd, I had gone back to my home in Missouri for a long weekend, and. Um, during that time, Paul Brauner, who was the radio program director, was trying to get in touch with me. Of course, uh, I wasn't home, so I wasn't picking up the phone. But he was a very um, accommodating kind of guy, and when I got back home in Stillwater, here was a telegram in the door. It said, if you're still interested, uh, give me a call, which, of course, I immediately did. And uh, he asked me to come down for an interview so I drove down to Oklahoma City. At that time, the WKY studios were in the Skirvin Tower. And um, I uh, parked the car, walked down to the, the studios, and the Skirvin Hotel across the street at that time had a shoe shine stand in the basement. And I thought, well, I need to put on the best possible face or foot, if you will. I've got, I've got to sell this deal. So I got myself a shoe shine walked across up to the studios, identified myself, sat down and waited, and uh, a little nervously, I must say. Mr. Bronner came out, went back to his office. We talked for about perhaps 15 minutes, and he offered me the job, which I immediately accepted. Showed me around the, uh, the studios. To my absolute total amazement, there were five people who did nothing but write for that radio station. Today that's, of course, ridiculous. No station does that. But WKY Radio at that time had a rule that everything that went on the air had to be written. The only exception was Danny Williams' Time and, Time and Tune Parade, which was an early morning disc jockey show. Everything else had to be written. And that's what these five writers did. There weren't so many advertising agencies at that time. They, they weren't as prominent as they later became. So uh, a lot of the copy that came directly from the advertisers came through our typewriters. And uh, it was uh, the, news, the uh, um, music director would uh, send in a list of uh, music that was to be played on any given program and then we were supposed to write introductions for it and the announcers read off the copy. None of this ad-libbing. So that's, uh, that's what I did. The, the first, um, well, the new guy on the block in the writer's group always got the worst possible assignments. And uh, the one they gave me was a polka parade that was done on Saturday afternoons. It was a request show and the uh, the listeners would send in, would you please play Blue Skirt Polka or something like that. 
uh, on a postcard and then you'd incorporate that in the script. The problem was that most of the people who were writing in didn't have really good handwriting and they, besides that they all had Czech names, most of which didn't seem to have any vowels. And it was kind of a challenge to uh, decipher the handwriting and then put a phonetic pronounce pronouncement in so that the poor announcer who was doing this would have some hope of getting through it. But that was always given to the new guy. Well, my job was writing radio copy, and uh, but like everybody else on, in WKY Radio, I was burning up to get into television. And I finally got a writing assignment for Sooner Shindig, which was the probably, I guess, the major live musical program they did at that time. It was um, a combination of country, western, and uh, pop, and, and all of that. It was a, a pretty good sized show for that little theater studio. So uh, that was a big thrill to be able to write the script for that. After that, um, I took a, a trip one weekend out to Britain Road to look at the new studio, which was um, being under construction at that time, and ran into Jack Lovell, who's, who was chief engineer. So he offered to give me a tour, which I thought was very gracious of him. And um, we started walking around different places. We were in the two big TV studios, and. I looked up and saw that the walls, the ceiling, everywhere was covered with a copper mesh. I asked him about that. He said, well, this is, um, it's kind of unusual. Nobody has ever built a television studio right next door to an AM radio transmitter. And we don't know what might happen, uh, whether those signals will get into the circuitry of the TV cameras or what. So we're, uh, we are electronically isolating this, uh, this entire studio complex with this uh, copper mesh. I'm sure it was really expensive. It, it's still there, by the way. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, time went on, and um, in September of 1951, we moved to radio and TV out to that Freak Road Studios. Now we were all together, and my desire to get into television was even more intense. And um, I talked to uh, Joe Jerkins, who was um, one of the directors at that time, and uh, wanted to know if I couldn't get out of uh, radio copy and um, get into TV somehow. In my um, rather juvenile mind, I thought I wanted to be a director, the guy who sits up in the studio and punches the buttons and tells everybody what to do. That sounded to me like the ultimate. So at that time, there was a rule that if you were going to be a director, go into training for that, you had to first go through training on stage crew. You had to learn how to light and uh, how to run the cameras and all of that stuff. Well, that was fine with me and I managed to, to wrangle a transfer from copywriting into the, the uh, studio work. It was, um, they, were, they were very um, particular about their video pictures at that time. Most TV stations in that era just simply put up some fluorescent lights and, and what they call flat lighting everybody, but that wasn't good enough for, for Channel 4. They, uh, they went to Hollywood and bought a bunch of focused lights and, uh, and a lot of other equipment that really went with the, uh, with the movie industry. And we had to learn how to light, uh, three-point lighting, a key and a fill and a backlight. My, um, my first assignment, very first assignment on stage, uh, I was assigned to a music program on Saturday night. I think it was Jane Hall and um, Al Tell playing piano. And a director who really had uh, visions of grandeur about what we could do about this. So I was assigned to push a dolly. Now the, the dolly was, it was called a Santa Crane and it was too, it was also imported from, from Hollywood. It was quite a nice piece of equipment, a four-wheel dolly with a big boom and a, the uh, camera and the camera operator sat at the end of this boom and then the poor soul who was uh, assigned to push this thing around uh, had a steering wheel at the back and uh, the thing was heavy and it was hard to push. I didn't know when I went in that night that that was going to be my assignment. I was wearing a pair of leather sole shoes and there was no way I could keep pushing that thing and gain any, any kind of traction with those leather shoes. It was a long night for me. Eventually, uh, I got a chance to do some actual directing. Uh, this was the sign-on shift, of course, the one that nobody wanted. 
And it was a fairly simple two camera shoot, news, weather, um, and the farm show. But I had hardly gotten started on that when I got a letter from the President of the United States suggesting that really what I needed to do was join the Army, which of course I didn't want to do at all. It was pretty much put out. It was during the Korean War. But when the President calls, of course, you know, you can't say no. So I ended up uh, in the Army at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas for two years. and. Um, that was the time when uh, television was just arriving to El Paso. There were two stations, uh, K KROD was a CBS station, KTSM was NBC. They were in a mad race to see who could be first on the air. The CBS station had very nice facilities and a, and a good staff. Unfortunately, they didn't have anybody on staff who had ever um, uh, directed a live program. I was down there for some reason in my army duties and uh, was talking to the program director and mentioned that I had been at uh, WKY and that I didn't tell him how little I directed but I told him I'd done live directing so they hired me in the evenings to do the, uh, the 10 o'clock news uh, grouping and I also directed the sign-on program so one of my, uh, one of my most famous uh, things that I can talk about is I directed the first television program in El Paso. I don't know what that's worth to the world, but anyway, I did. And uh, got into a regular Monday through Friday directing shift. The Army was kind enough to let me do that. It was, um, it was an interesting experience. The, um, the guy who did the news was the news director at the CBS station there. He thought that if he was, if he was gonna be on television news, uh, it ought to be something distinctive. So he wore a Walter Winchell snap brim hat and uh, tried to do a sort of a Walter Winchell impression. Uh, one problem with him was that he only had one good eye and I didn't know that for a while. I kept cueing him from the wrong side and getting no results at all. Finally, I figured it out. But in that period of time, I realized that I didn't want to be a director at all. Uh, directing is a real um, high pressure kind of job and uh, I don't do high pressure that well. I'm basically a writer and after a while I decided that it was a valuable experience and it, uh, it probably uh, was the one thing that uh, kept me from dying at age 25. Got out of the Army, I was ready to come back to uh, Channel 4, wrote them a letter told them I was getting out of the Army and they had said when you, you know, when your time's up let us know and we'll find something for you to do. And, uh, and they did. Um, Frank McGee was uh, on the news staff at that time. He went on to a long, very great career with NBC News. And they were starting a program called uh, Aftermath. Uh, this was the assistant manager, Hoyt Andre's idea, a real genius, by the way, in, um, in television. And it was a good idea. What he wanted to do was to go back and uh, do programs, do stories about people who had been in the news a month, a year, 10 years, whatever, whatever we could dig up and find out what happened to them and how that story played out in the, in the long run. It was a great idea, and, and they assigned me to be a cameraman uh, for uh, Frank and also do a little bit of the writing, although he did most of it. I had uh, sort of taught myself to shoot 16, mil 16 millimeter film in the Army, and uh, I wasn't as experienced as probably everybody thought at the station, but I figured I'd learn it as I went, which I did. Most, most all of us did that. Well, Aftermath was, a, was really a brilliant programming idea. The only problem was it was five nights a week, 15 minutes, and Frank and I were the only people producing it. Uh, it was insanity, actually. We were working all that summer through 12-hour um, days, 16-hour days, seven days a week, trying to keep up with the stupid thing. And finally, at the end of that summer, Frank went in and said, uh, I can't do this anymore, I quit. And the company had just bought a station in Montgomery, Alabama, and they offered him the news director job if he wouldn't quit, he took it and left. I stayed on uh, with Aftermath for a little while longer with another partner until finally it just crashed of its own weight. Frank got to Montgomery, Alabama just as Rosa Parks was getting on the bus. 
and that was the key to his future at uh, NBC News. I went back in the news um, uh, rotation, shooting uh, news stories on the street, writing scripts, that sort of thing. And uh, that went on for, oh, probably a year or two. In 1954, uh, another cameraman joined the station, a fellow by the name of Scott Burner. And uh, he'd been a still photographer in uh, Mississippi, but uh, nobody was asking too many questions in those days about how much uh, movie experience you had, so we all learned it together. Dick John, who was the news director, uh, called me and Scott in one day and said, uh, we would like to organize a documentary crew, and we want you two to, to do it. And we said, okay, uh, what do you want us to do? And to our astonishment, he said, well, you figure out what ought to be done. Keep us informed, let us know, get, get to work, and uh, start, start doing some documentaries. Well, we thought we'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, what, how great an assignment is that to actually be given the freedom, probably unheard of today, to do whatever you think ought to be done. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we thought would be a good thing, we were both interested in preserving Oklahoma history. We had heard about a newsreel photographer in the state back in the 1920s and 30s, the name of Benny Kent, out of uh, Chandler. Johnny Shannon, uh, the photographer at the station, had told us about Benny. And somewhere, um, he, he had saved all of this 35 millimeter newsreel film that he shot, plus a lot of other stuff that he shot. He'd covered everything that moved in Oklahoma from about 1918 on to um, 1945. The film was supposedly, it existed somewhere, but nobody knew what had happened to it. Uh, Benny had died, and we looked rather extensively for it, and we just couldn't come up with any clues at all what might have happened. We found out later that um, Benny had tried to sell it to the city of Oklahoma City, to this place and that place, and nobody was interested. And eventually, Lou Wentz, uh, an oil man in Ponca City, uh, had bought it uh, for an unknown amount. He didn't know what to do with it either, but uh, he, he put it in his corner of his office. Uh, in those days, 35 millimeter film was on what's called a nitrate base. Uh, it, it's no longer used. It's one of the reasons you can't smoke in movie theaters because nitrate base film not only burned, it almost exploded when, ex when uh, exposed to a flame, and in the process of burning, gave off uh, poison gas. So uh, somebody told Lou Wentz what he had in his office, and maybe he ought to get rid of it, and he gave it to Oklahoma State University. They didn't know what to do with it either. They put it in the projection booth at the college auditorium, and there it sat for years and years. And somehow or another, I can't remember now how, we found out where it was. We went up, and there it was can after can after can of this film, which was the history of Oklahoma from that, in that period. We just, we couldn't believe our good luck. And then we found out that about half of it had already deteriorated so badly that it just was gone. It made you want to cry, all of the, the governor's uh, inaugurations, all the things that happened in Oklahoma. But we talked to the um, university into letting us have it on the promise that um, we would get it, any of it we could, we'd get on safety film, 16 millimeter, and we'd give them a copy, and we'd use the rest of it for documentaries. We put it in the trunk of the car, in the back seat of the car, and drove it back to the station, and um, the stuff smelled pretty bad. It was sort of like um, uh, dirty feet, if that's the best way I can explain it. So when we took it in the station, there were some comments about this smell. We said we'll get it out of here as soon as we can. We didn't tell them what we really had and the dangers that, that we had with the uh, fire, but uh, we started going through it. A lot of it we had to throw away. Some of it uh, we sent to Hollywood uh, for a special print job because it had shrunk and, and the sprocket holes no longer matched up with the standard 35 millimeter projector. Eventually, we got enough material to do, I believe, 12 documentaries on Oklahoma history. These were, um, they're pretty successful. Um, they, uh, they won awards from the Western Heritage Center. We were actually, with one of them, we were nominated for an Emmy. 
Uh, we didn't win it. Uh, some station in Philadelphia, I believe, won it with a documentary on the plight of old people, which we always thought was just more East Coast bias against what we were doing out here in the, in the heartland. But the station got even with them the next year when um, George Wesley, Bob Dodson, and Oliver Murray won the Emmy for their documentary through a looking glass darkly. About that time, uh, Scott got a call from Frank McGee at NBC News. Um, he was being given a 30-minute documentary slot prime time on NBC, and he, was, he wanted uh, Scott uh, and me to come up and join the, the party. I didn't go uh, because I had three little girls and uh, res responsibilities back here, and I couldn't see moving to New York City. Scott, however, uh, he took off and had a long career with, uh, with NBC News. And I went back into uh, the, uh, the general run of news, and it was a, it was a pretty good life. About that time, uh, Joe Jerkins asked uh, if I would be interested in doing weather, which uh, I thought was kind of odd. But since I didn't have any formal meteorological training, but they were pretty desperate. Uh, they normally had three. Obviously, they were desperate. <laughs> They uh, normally had three meteorologists on staff and somebody had uh, resigned and they needed somebody to fill in the early morning shift. And um, so Joe had me cut an audition, which uh, I have to say was really, really bad. But he was a, he was a real good, good guy and he worked with me and so I started doing uh, early morning weather in addition to what I was doing on news. I guess I learned enough to stay out of trouble. I, I think my finest moment was um, one early morning in the winter time when I forecast flow snurries instead of snow flurries. In the early morning shift, we had a director named Billy Nix, who was quite a comedian. We also had uh, a fellow by the name of John Spence, who was running camera on that shift. I was doing weather, and we had a series of cue lights uh, that were um, used uh, off camera to tell me when it was time to, to break for a commercial. Well, Billy, um, he thought it would be really funny uh, to see if he could break me up on the air. There, there was some construction going on in the studio, and it was an electric jackhammer off to one side. And um, the, Billy's plan was to uh, plug this uh, jackhammer into an electrical outlet, and then just before the camera came to me, while I was still off camera, he would hit this jackhammer and make a terrible racket, and then he would switch to me and just see what happened, you know. What he didn't know was that the jackhammer outlet was also the same electrical circuit that the cue lights were on. So I'm going along doing the weather. He gives me a spot cue. The jackhammer goes off just as loud as you can possibly imagine. I'm told that I looked at the camera and said, well, I guess it's time for a commercial. I don't remember that. I think I blacked the whole thing out. <laughs> But everybody in the studio, I guess including me, had a great laugh over that. One of the nice things about working at Channel 4 and WKY Radio, for that matter, one of the nice things about working there was you were able to do all kinds of things. Anything you were big enough to do, you usually could do. I worked, um, as I said, not only early morning weather, but um, when, uh, when the farm directors were out of town, I, I took a turn at doing the farm program early morning. At uh, one time, uh, I worked with the football crew. We were doing simulcast radio and um, television, and I was a coordinator between the two. Uh, Bob Berry, Jack Ogle, famous names in sports, of course, were the ones we were working with. Uh, they had been working down at OU, doing the OU football games for a long time, and something happened, I never knew exactly what. But uh, I think part of it was that WKY Radio lost the rights uh, in a bidding war with KTOK for those football games. And Bob and um, Jack ended up doing OSU football. And once again, it was a simulcast with radio and TV. And uh, we were down at, um, at Norman, the final game of the year. We hadn't, uh, OSU, I say we because I went to OSU, OSU hadn't beaten OU in a very long time. And the uh, game was close. And right at the very blast of it, um, the um, quarterback threw a pass into the end zone. The OSU player caught it, and they won the game. Bob Berry 
punched the off button on his mic in a very loud voice said, take that, you so-and-sos. What he didn't realize was the crowd mic was right outside his window and it picked it up. And we all had a laugh about that. I think um, when they did the uh, play playbacks on television, they uh, came in and took those that little exclamation part out. Anyway, most people don't know it ever happened. Way back in 1949, when I first saw that black and white TV set in the window of the store in Stillwater, I always thought this was what I wanted to do, and I thought this was the place I wanted to be. It was a great ride, a great place to work, great people, and uh, I pretty much loved every minute of it.